Hi everyone, Dom Femulara here, and I am so excited to be back again for the Sabian Education Network, for Sabian Symbols. This is, this is an incredible opportunity. And what this crazy pandemic has given us is the ability of being able to use technology to our advantage that we can deliver to you all these different great, great interviews and information. I mean, I'm in my studio right now and I have a chance to bring today a very, very dear friend of mine, and I say one of my oldest dear drumming friends for sure. Would you please welcome Larry Levine? Thank you, Tom, and thank you to you and Joe and everyone at Sabian for extending the invitation. I am honored and I appreciate it. And I would like to acknowledge everyone for SEN and promoting drumming education. Yeah, it really is great. And uh, when, when Sabian kind of understood the importance of all these great, great teachers and all these great, great educators and players, and they put together the Sabian Education Network, and then they got Joe Bergamini to kind of come in there and manage it. Joe is exactly the right person to go in there and really kind of see the whole concept of what's happening with all these different drummers and educators. And tomorrow, we're gonna have Billy Cobham at two o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So having Cobham there, this is gonna be just fantastic to have the great legendary Billy Cobham. But I gotta tell you something, Larry, we go back a long, long ways. It's really kind of magical of all that we have been through together in this drumming world. Tell me, first of all, when you got involved with drumming, how old were you when you got involved with drumming? Well, as far back as I can remember, I've always had a pair of sticks in my hand. And I come from a very musical family. My mother, who was British, was on the stage. She had a vaudeville act, sang and danced and modeled. And my father, was a drum corps major and had a dance band through his formative years. Yeah. I've always had that influence. And I can remember my mother telling me of being five or six years old and crawling up on my father's drum set and just sitting there. And like most young kids, and I guess in uh, at a certain age had pacifiers. And what she used to do is sit me on the drum set. And I was just fascinated with this landscape in front of me. And that was probably my first real experience. And then as I started to develop, my mother taught me about dance, which uh, basically gave me a foundation for cadence and rhythm. And then my father taught me about drumming, basically gave me some of the skills about time and control and aspects as far as that. And then as I started to develop into my Later years, uh, my influences became involved with drum and bugle corps. Um, and of course, many players, as we know, Billy Cobham and Steve Gadd and David Garibaldi were involved in marching band. In fact, Michael Shreve and I, at different times, were members of the same drum corps, the Redwood City, California Police Youth Club Drum Corps. Oh, is that great? Michael Shreve, who is a phenomenal player to this day. Again, he goes back to the Santana days at Woodstock. Really? Woo! Fantastic. Well, that's great experience. So you had drum chord chops that you were developing at a young age. Exactly. And then, of course, taking those um, variations and applying to the drum set. My father always taught me about uh, working in the drum set, developing coordination, developing independence, developing control as far as that. And then started, I started studying formally. And uh, as I started to get a little older, um, being with people like Carmen Apice and Eddie Shaughnessy and Joe Morello and people like that. And that's really just started me on my way. And of course, when we talk about different influences, I'd have to say that, and this is something which we can talk about further too, what I try and initiate in my program of drumistics is not only talking about developing your performance skills and your playing abilities, but you always want to emulate your influences. Well, it's nice to be influenced, but don't forget when you're developing your performance skills, you want to always highlight your marketing skills because it's one aspect, okay, we're performers and we love the instrument, we have a passion for it. Once we develop skills, and we want to start broadcasting and getting into certain playing situations as a professional, semi-professional or hobbyist, we have to remember that what do we do with it? How do we promote ourselves, as you well know? So my influences as far as performing were Roy Burns and Eddie Shaughnessy and, of course, Mr. Hal Blaine, who I had the honor and the fortune of being friends with for almost 36 years. 
and like us, 45 years. <laughs> and I, I do want to thank the viewers for tuning in to our conversation today. I appreciate that. And I hope we can give them a little insight. And um, anyway, and of course, Dino Dinelli for the showmanship and the skills. Now, the marketing influences basically were Bob Zildjian, okay, Roy Burns, Roy Burns making that transition from performer to businessman, yeah. working with Aquarian, okay. Um, and of course, Mr. Joe Collado, who will be celebrating his 100th birthday next year. Yeah. He is, Joe is an amazing man. I've heard him play several times. Great, great drummer. Still playing drums and still an inspiration at 99. It's incredible. Unbelievable. I'll tell you. Yeah. We have many people here, Larry. We've got uh, Joe Bergamini says hello, and uh, he has joined us here too. And nice. again, he's reminding about how excited he is for tomorrow with Billy Cobham at 2 o'clock. So we've got this incredible opportunity. We've got Joseph Bonville. This is great to have him join us. Arthur is from Ufa, Russia. We've got Artemy Kor, who's here from Moscow with him and his beautiful wife. Excellent. His wife is the queen. He's just a servant. <laughs> Nina, Nina Pará is a phenomenal drummer who I've interviewed here before. She's from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Simon Bajaring was from Denmark, but he moved to upper state, upstate New York. Bill Sabi here. Chris Stanky is here. Chris Stanky is another oh, phenomenal oh, yes. energy from the, the Sabian Artist Relations. Chris, excellent, phenomenal. And uh, we've got so many people joining us. Dave Lewitt, look at this here. Clement Fiorti, this is so great. So we've got tons of people here. John Thank Owens you. is here. He, John Owens just joined us from North Carolina. So we got tons of people here that were reaching Larry globally. So a couple of things. First of all, in the process, you mentioned drumistics. Talk about your drumistics teaching program. Well, drumistics started, and we'll talk further about the extensions of drumistics. Drumistics basically started on the aspect of giving a foundation, giving a guideline for players of all styles, all genres, all ages, all levels, all capabilities. Giving them the insight is to develop a program which they can develop, uh, more or less initiate their performance skills, develop their performance skills, their playing abilities, going through variations and going through concepts, not only to help their aspects as far as understanding the drums, but what I'm a real purveyor of is education and history, the mm -hmm. musical and drumming history, learning about the aspects of where these players came from, where these players, what they were involved in, what they did, and how they contributed to the art form, basically. So I'm taking a lot of these different aspects and just sort of homogenizing them into one program to give players an insight, as I talked about marketing, talked about developing performance skills, as I reiterate that. But as an example, I collect vinyl. Now there's one aspect that we live in such an age of modern technology that people refer to me as the old schooler, okay? Because I like to use as a reference point some of the old school situations, yeah. like taking vinyl. And as an example, I'm just gonna share with you from my library now. It's one thing to have a CD listen to, but there's nothing like listening to the vinyl of Rich versus Roach, okay? Yeah. Nothing like listening to the vinyl of an original recording of Chick Webb with Ella Fitzgerald singing. Beautiful. These are so important as far as contributing to the educational process for a student, because a lot of the times the student may not have, <clears throat> excuse me, may not have the availability in which to listen, in which to view certain situations like this. <clears throat> so drumistics is broken down into four different categories. I have attitude, balance, commitment and control, and discipline. We talk about attitude, having an attitude in your playing with conviction and confidence, but not having an attitude, right. <clears throat> playing with an attitude with conviction, balance, Balance not only in your life, but balance in your commitment to drumming. So it all works together. The commitment to drumming and balancing not only your skills in playing, and there's a certain balance in which you and I have discussed before. It's one thing to select your drum set, 
but it's another thing to balance out another important clinical factor of your drum set, your cymbal setup. Yeah. This is so important. And Sabian, I know, has taken a lot of time and effort to put together cymbal packs, which are designed specifically for that sound purpose, a balanced sound. That's so important that students understand that. And it's so important that students recognize that and have the opportunity to choose that. The third category would be commitment and control. Let's face it, it's a solo instrument when you practice, you have to commit yourself and you have to develop control. The other aspect, D, would be discipline. Of course, disciplining yourself to practicing as far as that. There's no magic key here. It's all about practicing. It's all about developing a style. It's all about setting a guideline for yourself, no matter what level you're going to be performing on or playing on, whether it's going to be a hobbyist, whether it's going to be a pro, whether it's going to be anything in between. Anybody who just, I mean, I have people who just enjoy drumming. They just like drummers and they just like the aspect and the art form of drumming. And what you have to do, yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. So, so, so what this is, I want to clarify, what this is, it's the ABCD of your drumming program, which again, falls under the drumistic umbrella. Absolutely, absolutely. So go, go back again, give us the ABCD again of what that is, so everybody can kind of can really take this in. Okay, well, Drumistics has, has a title, it's called From Pad to Performance. And it's basically a, an interactive learning program. Interpretation plus creativity equals style. So we're talking about A, attitude, playing with an attitude of conviction, playing with an attitude of confidence, not having an attitude. Right. B would be balance, balancing not only your drumming approach, but balancing your life also as far as that. The fact of balancing your drumming skills and your equipment also, not neglecting your cymbal setup, which requires a balance too. And then the interaction of the balance between the drums and the cymbals are so right. important. So you can develop an overall sound which you're comfortable with. That's the most important thing. You wanna be comfortable with your setup and you wanna be comfortable with your sound. Right. And C would be commitment and control, committing yourself. If you have the passion, the commitment comes easy. Yeah. Developing the control and a D of course being the discipline, disciplining yourself to practicing and disciplining yourself to furthering your education and drumming. So you take each of these students through these different steps of these areas. Absolutely. And by having that, you're developing not only their drumming skills, but their personality skills, their open-mindedness to have the attitude, absolutely the commitment, the discipline, the balance. Absolutely. Beautiful, beautiful. And, excuse me. For the people who want to pursue, say, a, a professional aspect, we talk about the marketing, developing marketing skills. And how do, as I mentioned earlier, how do you take your drumming skills and promote it? That's the important thing. And with people like yourself as a guide and people like as I said, the people from Sabian and Sen, it offers them a platform now in which to make the direction, I think, a little easier for them because now they can see different sources in which to choose from. And I think that's so important. And education to me is the primary, is one, I shouldn't say, is one of the primary aspects of the program, educating everybody in the whole concept of drumming. Enjoying your drumming, having the passion and trying to recognize that passion and hopefully reawaken that passion and to inspire them, to motivate them, to educate them, and of course, to entertain them. Absolutely, Larry. Boy, this is, this is really fantastic. You know, we've got several more people joining us. We've got Rocky Petrocelli. Absolutely. She's there. We've got Bruno Muse, who's from Antwerp, Belgium. He's on right now checking out what's happening. Steve Fraskell. From uh, in Michigan, uh, is it, uh, from Steve Frakes in Michigan, drum love. I don't know what that means, but 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 man, so thanks, thanks for joining us. Thank you. We've got Bobby Angeletta who's had joined oh, us here. Bobby, from of course, yeah. your area of where you are. So this is incredible. So so with this here, so you're taking them through this journey. Let's go back now over the history again. Okay. I mean, you are a proponent of history. You have some Davy Tuff recordings, right? 
Right. I was just going to mention that um, people like Rocky and um, uh, Petroselli and um, Joe Bonville are close friends of mine. Now, Rocky has one of the top music studios and stores in the area. And we were talking about later the projects that I was involved in. We talk about history. And we're actually collaborating on setting up a series of DH Drumistics Masterclasses with his studio, Drum History Masterclasses, where we can take people through the whole series of developing. And I mentioned about recordings, and I just grabbed a few of these recordings that I have. And this is something, as I mentioned, that it's one thing to have the uh, extensive technology that we have. Yes, we can listen to the CD, we can watch the DVD, but it's one thing to have the actual recording of Artie Shaw with Buddy playing. Mm. And it's one thing to have the actual album of Gene Krupa, Percussion King. That's so it's, it's one thing, and I just have, and it's one thing to have Buddy Rich's big band. I mean, the list goes on at Tony Williams' lifetime. The list goes on and on with these. And also the Skyliners, Drum and Bugle Corps, okay? Yeah. The Rascals. I mean, when you have vinyl this extensive, I believe, share it. Share it. This is one of the medias I want to share as far as that and let people hear the actual reference point, the origin. What were these artists thinking? What was their frame of mind when they were recording this? Listen to the production. Okay, it's not the best of what you're going to hear, but you have to remember this is the perspective of where we came from. Well, it's so important. You know, as you know, I'm a strong believer of this historical sense of going back to learn so we can find out where we're going. It really is a big, big part of it. And you mentioned people like Davey Tuff and, and even Gene. I mean, you know, Gene Krupa, a lot of people have kind of forgotten the impact that Gene had in our industry. Listen, if it wasn't for Gene Krupa, I don't think we'd be doing what we're doing. You know, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And, and there's got, excuse me. two drum sets in my studio. I've got the studio that I have and I've been teaching. Gene had a studio with Cozy Cole many, many years ago. They had hundreds of students a week. They had two drum sets in every room. They had mirrors all over the place. I mean, these guys were so ahead of their game. They were doing that in the 40s and 50s. So these guys really kind of opened up the, they paved the groundwork for us to do what we're doing now. What do we have as an advantage? We've got some serious technology here. Well, that's taken it to a whole nother level. Absolutely. You mentioned Cozy Cole. Here is um, an album yeah. of Cozy Cole. Um, Larry's going back into his treasure. <laughs> but we talk about artists. I mean, we can't forget people like Bobby Graham, okay, the English Hal Blaine. Yeah. We can't forget people that were so influential in our contemporary music, too. Of course, Hal and people like um, Earl Palmer, okay, and people like uh, Gary Chester and Johnny Barbada and people like yeah. Talk about when you first met Hal Blaine. When, when, when did that happen? Hal Blaine and I met, and it was like the meeting of the long-lost nephew and uncle. <laughs> and uh, when um, and you and I had met, not to digress, but you and I had met in in a was it a I think it was a festival. It was a drum festival we went to, and you and I were like next door neighbors. I mean, as soon as we met each other, yeah, yeah, forty five years later now. So, but Hal and I met um, in 1984. Five, I believe, and uh, he was at a music store and uh, at the drum center, and uh, I um, received an invitation to go down and meet him. And as soon as I met him, as I said, it was like my long lost uncle, and we kept up the correspondence for until the time that he, he left us. It was just amazing. I mean, the arrangement and the relationship that we had. I mean, he would give me guidelines and send me for my teaching program, which I share with students. I mean, he would send me material rehearsals that he had, not from the from the Wrecking Crew film or anything, these actual rehearsals of, absolutely. And then we have this one too. His book, I mean, he's got a book, and plus the Wrecking Crew movie, which you can watch on Netflix. You know, uh, you know get to know who Hal Blaine was. Hal, uh, I had a chance of interviewing Hal Blaine on the Sessions panel on YouTube. Everyone go to the Sessions panel, subscribe, absolutely, subscribe to the Sessions panel and go watch my interview with Hal Blaine. This right. Guy, this guy, what a, what, a, what a treasure he was. It was amazing. I mean, people don't realize that these players were so unheralded 
And of course, they're recognized amongst our constituents, but for the general public, it's very important for people to realize that and to know that. And when I have general students who come in, it's so important for them if they listen, because they've been listening to this sonic venture all their life, these records, and now they're beginning to realize that, oh, these are the people that played on this, or oh, these are the people that really, now I can begin to realize, and I, if I'm involved in drumming, not only can I appreciate it more, but I can look at my drumming now from a completely different perspective. Yeah. As far as understanding a little bit about the player, as far as that. And we mentioned um, in the history, um, just sharing some of the history that I have. Frank's for the memories, okay? The story of the, the legendary Chicago drum shop. I mean, yeah. just aspects like that and introducing them to uh, legendary vintage snare drums. I mean, it's amazing what, what you have to try and <clears throat> develop over the years. And for anybody who's watching who wants to, as you well know, and I can, I'm sure you can attest to this, who wants to develop, especially with the situation now, wants to develop a teaching studio, I think it's important to gather a library for yourself yeah. so you can share this. It's not just about learning about technique. It's not just about learning, developing playing abilities and performance skills. It's about understanding your instrument and trying to share some of your knowledge and share some of your experiences. That's the whole thing, the experiences. And I've been very honored and fortunate in my career to have some incredible experiences on all aspects. Because what I try and do is explain to people diversity is the key. The older students who want to develop into a professional career, diversity is the key. Yeah. If one platform or one door is not available. You have to be able to develop education. You have to be able to develop performance skills. You have to be able to develop a recording aspect, understanding how it is to record as far as that. So, and of course, the other aspect being, as I said, you have education, performing, okay, and um, developing your recording and literary, hmm. developing your writing skills, which I'm sure you, you, you know about. And I was very honored to be involved with Classic Drummer for 10 years. And uh, in fact, we're coming out with the 20th anniversary issue next year. But this is so important. People like, especially in the times we're in now, um, the fact of really developing your writing skills. Absolutely. Like, boy, talk about the classic drama because you were involved with that for all those years. And there's going to be, like you said, a 20th anniversary coming up. Talk about, you know, where did you get these writing skills? Where, where did you get these ideas of being able to interview these people and write it out? Where'd that all come from? I think it all came from um, basically who I was involved with, a young woman, Michelle Lansing. She was one of the top book editors in the country. And I think she, as you well know, she helped me develop a lot of my literary skills when I started working with Classic Drummer yeah. and having the experience and the privilege of interviewing a lot of these artists who I grew up with and listen to and were influenced by also as far yeah. as that. Yeah. And this went on for 10 years or plus being involved with the advisory board and as a writer and everything. You know, it, it's interesting how we have, I've got people that are already requesting putting together a, you know, a, a history, you know, you know, you know, information. So there's something which we'll discuss in the future as far as doing something at that level where history becomes clarified on how we can live it. Daniel Glass does a great job with this right. here. He's right. got fantastic historical information, which would be good to go into. Another phenomenal player. We've got people that have joined us. Menzi Pittman, who's a phenomenal energy in the music industry, is with us today. Tony McNally, a phenomenal drummer who's from Newcastle, UK, has joined us. Catherine Wall, a student of mine who's from Christchurch, New Zealand. Unbelievable. Right now, it's probably 6 o'clock in the morning tomorrow that she's watching this here. Well, thank you, Catherine. I appreciate it. Michael Scott has joined us from Canada. Stephen Chamberlain is here now from the uh, Quebec City, Canada area. So there's got some great people that have joined to say hello, Larry. This is great. The, uh, so let's, let's talk about, so you also got involved in uh, the TV show. Tell me about the TV show. Uh, the TV show, thank you. The TV show was quite an experience. The TV show was something that... Uh, when I was, and we'll talk about the Recording Academy, kind of tied in together, that the yeah. TV show, when I was approached by this producer, um, 
which at a recording session, and he asked me if I'd ever thought of documenting some of my material because I was explaining to one of the engineers there about drumming and everything. And I said, no, I had never thought about that. So he put me in touch with Time Warner and we set up an appointment. And from there, it just started rolling. We just started the cameras rolling and I basically just started working on material and chapters. And we ended up with uh, 32 segments, half hour segments, which are still in circulation. And I have a YouTube channel coming out over the holidays, which are going to document and um, start showcasing a lot of the vintage uh, drumistic shows. Nice. And one day, one of the producers came in and um, said to me, why don't we take one of these shows and submit them to a media award? I went, a media award? What do you mean a media award? He said, you know, like the Emmys. So I said, what? So we sent it, we sent one segment to in uh, 1999 to the Communicator Awards. And um, to our surprise, we ended up winning that. <laughs> the following year later, we decided to submit it to um, the um, uh, Videographer Awards. And um, that was in 2000. We ended up winning that. So it just basically escalated. And after that, we had a lot of um, calls and a lot of inquiries into the show. <clears throat> now, from the show, another interesting story was that in another recording studio, in another session, I was approached by someone, uh, another producer, and he was talking about the Recording Academy. And the Recording Academy, and this all ties in with education again, he explained to me about the Recording Academy being the committee that votes on the Grammys. <clears throat> well, as a result of that, I ended up contacting them, and it was a whole process, and I was honored to be voted in, and you can take it from there as far as what happened from that. Listen, you've taken this to a, you've got a whole wall of awards that you know has blown me. Can you, to turn the camera, just show the people that wall of awards, if you can, Larry. This is, I want everyone to see that. This is hard work. This is, this is, you're in your studio right now at your home yeah. studio. He's got a whole wall of awards from the Grammys and from, from all, all around different organizations. This is hard work and effort in the drumming community to keep music alive, both in the teaching and recording ability and even in the media ability with the magazine. This is incredible to see, Larry, that, you. Uh, you know, what you've accomplished in your lifetime that has been so great to see the the workings of all this this hard work is paying off well i think it comes down to a lot of support also and again it, it all stems from working with an attitude but not having an attitude having that conviction and being able to really provide some kind of of service and having the passion if people have the passion then it definitely will enroll itself. That's the way I believe in it, following a natural approach. Everything happens for uh, an organic reason as far as that. It, it really is, Larry. You know, everyone that has joined on, it's, it, I'm blown away. I mean, Michael Scott is a wonderful student of mine. He's studied with many, many other people. He's heavily into research and the history. He lives up in, in, uh, in the, not, not that far outside of Toronto in Canada and uh, in Hamilton. It's just so great to see these people that have come on that, are, that, that get it also. George Breitner is a, a new student of mine that uh, is from the Connecticut area, and he's learning all this stuff here. Mm -hmm. And it's just so great to see this information that we're passing on to continue to this next generation. Absolutely. I think that's the key is to provide the information, to provide the knowledge, and to provide the uh, confidence that people coming in, it's not about capability. It's not about level. As you well know. Drummers, biggest sorority and the biggest brotherhood in the world. Drummers love to share everything. And the fact is, it's always been that way. I mean, when you have people that uh, we go back to Mr. Roy Burns again, who was one of the first people to be involved with a clinic, be involved with a workshop. I mean, he was traveling extensively in the early days, sharing the knowledge, promoting the knowledge. Yeah. sharing his experiences. And from there, it just basically developed. It just basically mushroomed. Boy, Roy, again, I say to everybody, the Sessions panel, go to YouTube on the Sessions panel. 
subscribe to the channel, and go watch my interviews with all of these top drummers. But you mentioned Roy Burns. I interviewed Roy. It was one of his last interviews before he passed on. Mm -hmm. And it just, I mean, he played the early days. He talked about playing with Benny Goodman. This is a guy that really was so dedicated at all levels, playing the educational part, the manufacturing part, the writing for Modern Drummer Magazine all those years. This is a guy that made it happen. And we have those great leaders that have guided us along the way to move this agenda forward. Roy was a, just a beautiful human. He really was a great person. Absolutely. And, and I feel that um, educators such as myself um, have to continue sharing this knowledge, have to continue broadcasting the experiences. And this is why I tried to amass a library like this, because it allows me to have the reference points to share with these young students and to inform them and to educate them and to at least give them a working knowledge of, many of them may not even be able to go out or be able to perform, but mm -hmm. the fact is at least they'll have an understanding of the art form of drumming, that it's not just about coming in and learning to develop your playing skills and your performance abilities, it's about understanding the instrument, and I think that's so important. Boy, look at how great this is. Check this out from, from George Breitner. George, thank you. Right. I wish there were access to programs like this 20 to 30 years ago. The younger generation has such an opportunity to learn from drumming masters right here in their own home. This is George, well put. This is the new world we live in now. George, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you for your support. It really, really is amazing. We've got uh, Claude Hoffman here, who's a wonderful drummer from from Belgium. He has joined us also. So it's just so great to see all these different drummers that come in here. And it's just incredible to see the fact that we have this opportunity now to kind of get out there and have this accessibility. Right, right. And people are always inquiring and, and asking me about situations that, um, what direction can I go in? What avenues can I take? And again, it's to reiterate, and, and I've been very blessed to have and honored to have students who have really excelled, Jason Bittner and Joe Travers and people yeah. like that, Lindsey Barton and Jimmy Aiello from Massachusetts excellent drummers in their own right who have actually gone on to perform and actually worked in a capacity of a, a much larger scale, probably national and international as far as that. So Boy, this is well taken. And Jason Bittner, who's a phenomenal player, Jason is actually a part of the Modern Drummer Festival totally. that's happening this Saturday, September 12th. For everyone to go to moderndrummer.com, buy your ticket. It's a tribute to Neil Peart. It is an absolutely phenomenal event that's going on. And Jason's a part of it. I saw Jason's footage. He plays great and gives an incredible tour of his collection of Neil Peart kits. You Absolutely. gotta go buy them. I just watched the show just for that. It's fantastic. Jason's a real good person. I, I can remember him being 16 years old and coming to my clinics. So Am I dating myself now, Jay? And, <laughs> uh, I knew that he was destined. I knew that he was destined from then on as yeah. far. And Joe Travers, of course, Frank Zappa, keeper of the Zapp Zappa vault now, yeah. and people like that. So. It's, I think that, and I'm sure you can attest this, and a lot of the viewers can attest this as far as instructors. I think it's really satisfying and gratifying when you see students like that who you have tried to initiate and give direction and guidelines to and set forth some kind of aspect to help them and assist them with their drumming, take it to another level and just excel in that level. I think that's so gratifying for the instructor and for the teacher. And it makes it makes it all worthwhile when it comes to different aspects like that. Absolutely, Larry. You know, so so you live in the in the, in the Albany area, upstate New York. Fairtown Springs, yes. Right. So what what so what educators are there? Who'd you start learning from to develop all your skills? Who who were some of the teachers around that area in the early days? Well, I think one of the teachers that I was really involved with was David Hanlon. And David was out of Syracuse. And David really understood my direction and really understood how to develop my skills. And he knew that I wanted, even though I was performing with a band and touring, and we've all done that, and uh, that most of us have done that, okay? And um, I had that aspect. I wanted to always pursue education. And in the area, as far as the Albany area, um, we had people like Freddie Blood, okay, who was a very renowned jazz drummer. Yeah. And I can remember that my father was very friendly with Cozy Cole. 
And when Cozy Cole would come into the area, okay, my father would bring me down and I would sit with Cozy Cole. And it was just amazing. And then I remember my father said, I have tickets to this performance I would like to take you to. I think I was about 10. And um, he took me to see Buddy. And that was it. <laughs> okay, it was a theater in the round yeah. and, uh, in Albany. And I think that was it as far as that. But then I started to pursue it. And my father would take me to New York to meet different people and to meet different uh, drummers that were really involved in the field. And um, as I said, like Cozy and people like that. And that's where I basically learned. And then to be able to travel when I started to get a little older, um, he was always teaching me the basic concepts of playing. And drum corps really opened up a lot of doors. And I'm sure you yeah. can guess, again, I mentioned this, the yeah. fact that being able to take your skills and embellish on them, being able to take your skills from drum corps and being able to develop them on the drum set. Yeah. Drum corps is a great, great platform. It's a great avenue in which to really, really um, endeavor in as far as learning about drumming skills and learning about yeah in your craft it'll it'll open your mind for sure you know who joined us who's been listening is guy gelso oh guy my god guy is a phenomenal drummer with the band zebra guy is just still on top of it playing better than ever i've seen some videos from his studio he's got an online school he's put together guy has joined us and he said here check this out here i gotta got show this <laughs> I used to go to Larry's house upstate and share ideas with him when I was teaching at the Long Island Drum Center in the 80s. And he was very involved teacher back then and even had so much more to share now. So this is fantastic. Guy, thanks for joining us. Guy, thank you so much. It's great to hear from you. And we will be in touch. It's been too long. It really is great to see. So now, so, so you're studying with these teachers around there. So, so just talk about the first time you went to see Buddy Rich. What did that do to you as far as witnessing the sheer magic of this man. You know, there's not many people today that are around that have heard Buddy play live. Buddy Absolutely. died in 1987, I believe it was. Yeah. And right. uh, April of 87. So, you know, now, you know, 33 years later, you know, there's a whole other world right now of what's happening. So Absolutely. What, was it, what was it like when you first heard Buddy play? I can only state and relate one word, epiphany. <laughs> Life-changing. Okay. And I thought to myself, this is beyond description, really, when you watch a gentleman like that play and how he developed a whole sense. We talk about confidence. That's confidence personified right there. Yeah. The fact is. And watching Buddy perform, I think, opened a lot of doors for me as far as getting involved with people like Roy Burns and Eddie Shaughnessy and Morello and seeking out people like Shaughnessy to study with yeah. and seeking out people like Roy to study with and establishing relationships with them that would carry over until they left us. Well, you know, Ed Shaughnessy, again, I have one of an interview with Ed Shaughnessy on this sessions panel. And I ask everyone to go by there and just check out that interview. These interviews are totally not about me. It's an opportunity where I'd be able to sit down with these people to hear their story. Ed, aside from playing with, the Johnny Carson band for like 30 years. Right. He, he tells stories about when he played on the Carson show with Jimi Hendrix. I mean, I he played, it. yes. I mean, just, you know, from Sinatra to Hendrix, from Barbara yes. Streisand to everybody, what an amazing career he had. So, what was it like studying with Ed? Ed was phenomenal because Ed, again, opened up a lot of doors for me as far as what happened with Ed is that we had kept our relationship and our friendship throughout. And when I had the privilege and the honor and the opportunity to interview him for a cover story I did, it was amazing. It was amazing because we used to engage in these conversations and I'd have to keep everything on track as far as the formality of the interview for the magazine. And we would just speak for hours, literally hours, just talking about everything in, in the world of drumming and how the changes in drumming and the fact of the aspects of different players and how drumming has evolved. But Ed opened up a lot of doors for me as far as understanding genres in music. He really did. He really set forth a pattern for me of understanding and saying to my, me, look, 
at least have a working knowledge of Latin music, at least have a working knowledge of rock, at least have a working knowledge of funk, country. I'm not saying you have to be a total authority, but at least have an understanding of the basic concepts of these genres of music. So yeah. that when you want to sit in with a group, and it's like I tell people now, students who want to get into recording, as you well know, that's a whole different chapter. The fact is, Understanding different genres of music, being able to play different styles, diversify yourself, not only in your aspects as far as your career, we talked about the different doors, but diversity in your understanding of different styles of playing. This is so important today. And of course, with the advent of modern technology, it's wide open now. If someone wants to just view a certain player playing a certain style, that's all they really have to do. So Ed really opened up a lot of doors for me as far as that. And as far as Roy, Roy was really instrumental in the whole marketing aspect as far as learning about the, because he, as I said, here he was promoting education as a clinician, but he also was developing the whole marketing aspect. First, of course, with Rogers, and then of course going on to um, develop and um, originate Aquarian drum heads as far yeah. as. So I think that was important to be involved. And I was very honored to be involved with these people because, again, what I try and do is share that knowledge and try and pass that knowledge that has been given to me that I've been honored to receive. Because right. it's so important that if someone asks me a question or inquires about a certain concept, I can relate and say, OK, this is what Hal told me. This is what Roy shared with me. This is how Ed developed it and shared it with me. And certain aspects like that. Well, it's amazing to see, you know, we mentioned these names and, and these are gentlemen that devoted their lives to the art form of pushing them forward. They played great and they had long careers. I mean, Ed, when I interviewed Ed, it was just about a year before he passed away. He was still practicing and playing. He was going out with Doc Severance and still to do dates yeah. in Vegas and Arizona. I mean, you know, he was already in his 80s. Severson was even a little older than him. Out on the road, hitting the road, still going strong and playing great. It was great. And, and what was another aspect that I was very, very um, privileged to be involved with was I would, these people would be, I, I could consult with these people. Like when a situation developed, like with the Recording Academy, I consulted with Roy and I consulted with Ed on this, on yeah. what the initial decision and the, the procedure. And they were very instrumental in giving me guidance as far as that and yeah. saying, okay, maybe this is a certain avenue you should follow and this is. And I used them, of course, as my references. And this is how I was honored to be voted in as far as that. So well, it really great. opened up a lot of doors. But, you know, you, you, you really took from these great, great players, Larry, and you – you incorporated that into not only your your personality, you incorporated it into your style of playing, you incorporated it into your style of teaching, and you really kind of took this in. And you really are one of the guys that are now, you know, carrying on this 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 legacy that is so important for this for everyone to understand. Absolutely, the next generation and this current generation. Absolutely. We can't, we can't you know mislead ourselves by by just only looking forward. There is some phenomenal playing that had gone on that is still equally inspiring today as when I heard it 40 years ago. Absolutely. And I think this is important for people to understand and not forgetting some of the unheralded players like Bobby Graham, who was so instrumental in playing all those British hits that yeah. we were accustomed to. It's one thing, okay, so we were honored with Hal's contribution, but it's another thing to have people like Bobby Graham. And I think it's important, as you just mentioned, to carry on the legacy and let people understand and let people have a working knowledge of these certain players and how they contributed to the art form. That's so important, the fact is, and all these different, um, all this different material we listen to in our formative years. Yeah. I think what it does, it just contributes to a much more solid understanding of drumming. But listen to how these young guys, here's Steve Samuel, great interview, great that Larry is talking about his mentors. I mean, this is really, this is really what, what we need to hear more of in the process. You know, great, great. And I think that what, what's interesting about it, Larry, is you've been with Sabian for a long time, you know, you're, you're well over 30 years. Yes, 37 years next year. And talk about your relationship with that. And I got to also bring up, before you get into, into symbols that you use and your, 
<laughs> what about the, the, the co-design with Peter Chris? Oh, this is so, this is um, when I was in Canada on one of my many visits during the 80s, um, I was approached by uh, Peter Stairs, still a great friend. And uh, we were chatting, and at the time with Sally was there and Bob Ego and people like that, and Roy Edmonds, Mr. Roy Edmonds. And uh, we were just chatting about different symbols, and we were just talking about different sound displacements and different aspects as far as symbols. So I came up with this wild idea where one of the sets was there, and I started playing it. I said, wouldn't it be interesting to take uh, what I call like a mutant set, a mutant symbol, and let's put an 18-inch bell on a 12-inch heavy-duty splash? <laughs> they looked at me like, what? That might work. And it did. So Peter had just come in from um, – uh, another tour with Kiss, and uh, he and I conversed, and we ended up designing this 12-inch rock splash, which has been just tremendous. I mean, I've been my setup. People are saying, "What is that set? What is that?" <laughs> <laughs> so, but my relationship with Sabian started uh, in New York, and um, I was introduced by um, a gentleman to Mr. Bob Zildjian. And um, from that, it just developed, of course, working with Andy mm -hmm. and Andy Zildjian, the son, and over the years. And uh, it's just one of those relationships that's indescribable. Um, every year, it just keeps getting better and better. And every year, there's, there's such an amazing comfort zone dealing with these people that it's just been an incredible relationship, not only professionally, as far as that, but informally too. They're just great, great friends to deal with Chris and everybody and Charlene and Karen from Canada, just yeah. people. So the relationship with Sabian. Now this is another aspect, if you don't mind me talking about, we talk about endorsements, we talk about representations. And I know you and I have had countless discussions upon uh, this, your, your great article in Gig Magazine about that, that I think one of the under misunderstandings is when I'm approached with people about how do I develop a point in my career where I can start basically initializing for an endorsement or representation? And as you know, it's, a whole, it's all about reciprocation. It's not about receiving free gear. It's about being able to convey a representation with integrity, with quality, with class, and, of course, being able to promote the company to the best of your ability. And if you have something to offer and promote them, then I think it's all legitimized. Yeah. But the fact is we try to talk about the fact that endorsements a lot of times, representations a lot of times, seem to curve in the wrong direction. And people think, okay, if I hook up with a company, I'm going to be receiving free gear, which is the last that we are considering as far as that. So my relationship with Sabian lasting almost 40 years is because of that, because I've tried to at least convey a reciprocating relationship with them. As yeah. much as they give to me, I try and give as much in return. As far absolutely, as absolutely. Talk about the symbols specifically. What what, what what symbols do you have on your set? Any any line in particular that you? Uh... I'm using. I have a list here. Depending on the situation, I mean, um, I'm basically using for my hi hat. I like to choose between um, my 13 inch HHX. Okay, the groove hats. Yeah. And I'll also use a set of the AAX studio hats. Okay. And then for general teaching and general performances depending on the situation. Sometimes I use what's a 12 inch set of AA mini hats with a set of rivets in the bottom, which gives a nice wash, a nice oh. little sustain as far as that. And then for crashes, I'll use anything from a 12 to a 14 to 16, anything from AAs to AAXs, studio, and um, medium crashes to thin crashes. And then for special effects, um, I like to use 14-inch uh, Chinas, AA Chinas. And um, for my rides, I I'll choose. I, I actually been getting into my 18-inch Ed Thigpin, okay, signature flat ride. How great was that symbol? That that's a great symbol. And and then, of course, for general purposes and teaching and recording, I like to use my 18-inch El Sabor. And that seems to be really serving the purpose. And then 
For some, if I'm doing a, a, a percussion, a hybrid gig, like a more low key gig or a low key recording, I use, which is a real interesting symbol. And it's a symbol that Peter Stairs and Nord Hardgrove had recommended to me. It's a 16 inch HH Manhattan bridge ride. Nice. Which is a great symbol. And then, of course, for my effects, my splashes, I'll use the 8-inch Raptagon with a couple of rivets in it. And um, one other symbol that's uh, a 12-inch rock splash. So <laughs> that that, changes. That's fantastic. And, and, and when you think about it, just the insanity of, of all the stuff that we, we have. But again, you, what you've done, which is very smart, you've got a selection of symbols that is adapted for the gig or the teaching that you're doing at that time. That really is smart. I think it's 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 absolutely, thank you. And I think it's important as we talked earlier about balance, the balance of symbols. And I think for young players, Sabian has really gone to strides in putting together these balance packages. So people don't have to go out and by chance choose a select ride and then choose a set of hats and choose a crash symbol. They can actually have that all chosen for them. It's all selected for them. Pick up your symbol pack, go home, put it on, and just play. And everything's balanced right there. And I think that's so important to have that balance of sound because people will notice, and I can't tell you, and I'm sure you can attest to this as an instructor, the frustration young players have sometimes yeah. when they don't either have the working knowledge or they can't get the information and in how to select not only a drum set, but let's not forget our cymbal setup also. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. You know, what we have here, a couple of things here. We've got Bobby Angelina, love it, Larry, nailing it. Thank Bruno, you. Bruce. Great interview. Again, Bruno's from, from Antwerp in Belgium. Joe Bergamini coming on. Great insights and wisdom. This is fantastic to see it. And then Sabian themselves from the headquarters. Thanks for your loyalty to Sabian, oh, Larry. Proud to have you with us. This is so Thank great to see that this opportunity that we have in this program to be able to allow everyone to kind of get to know who you are right. and, and, and play the game here as far as, listen, you're serious at what you're doing. I want to go on and explain to people that you're still doing some lessons in person. Absolutely. Tell, talk about how you've set your studio up with the distinction of the drum kit in a separate area and what you've done. Well, again, thank you. I, I, I thank you to everyone and, and thank you to all the viewers. I really appreciate the uh, support and I really appreciate them tuning in. And if I can give some insight and as I hope to have a establishing correspondence with people who are viewing us, um, please feel free. And of course, with Sabian, I can't say enough. It's like my second family. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, the setup, um, I don't want it to sound dated because as people watch this 10, 15, 20 years later, they're going to go, what? You know? So what we try and do is we try and work with contemporary times here. Unfortunately, we're dealing with a situation that's beyond our control. So what I tried to do is physically set up my studio so that uh, following this rigid and strict protocol that unfortunately we have to follow right now. Yeah, so what yeah. Done, yeah, so what I've done is I just set precedence of having distance, social distancing, and I've had uh, everything's disinfected, everything's sanitized, so that when the player comes down, of course, everything's covered, and they can still be in a relaxed and a very controlled environment. I think this is important to have, and for your teachers out there and your instructors out there, if you want to resume or start up your personal contact, I think it's important for the main aspect, just separate your kits. That's the main thing. Put as much distance as you can between your kits and have as little personal contact as you can with the student as far as physical contact. Um, I know that some players like to actually physically show the hand positioning and show the actual stick control, maybe refrain from that. And then the other aspect, of course, is protection, masks, and gloves at some point as far as that. I think if you just follow protocol, which I've done, I think if people want to resume a personal lesson program or resume their already existing personal lesson program, I think that's important to follow. And I think it's just following common sense at this point, really. Yeah, well, that, that's so great. But the fact that you have people coming by and you've got the your studio set up where people can come by, be separated, come in there and still learn. It's so great. Aside from online lessons, I mean, you're really doing it all, Larry. It's so great. And people are joining us from everywhere. Here's Tony Canelli. Tony Canelli is another phenomenal player and teacher 
from England. I think he lives near the Sheffield area, if I remember correctly, Tony. And I met Tony 35 plus years ago doing different clinics. And it's just so great to have these people joining us from across the pond Thank to hear you. your words and what you're saying. And at some point, I'm going to get t Tony on this on this show also. May I share a story? My, Tony, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate the support. My mother was British. And uh, a quick story I'll share with, with, with all of you. This is in 1964 now. And um, my mother went back to England to visit. And um, when she came back and she was landing, I remember going to the airport and there were just hundreds and hundreds of these teenage girls lined up at the airport and it was almost impossible to get in the plane before after my mother i think it was two planes after my mother had the beatles oh it was incredible <laughs> that was a time back in 1964 when the beatles came in where insanity started it influenced so many players that's right they them on tv i mean there's all of the top artists that i ended up speaking to were so influenced by their presence on that show when we heard them in America. That's a pretty powerful thing. The fact that your mom was right there, that's huge. <laughs> we talk about influences, and I think it's important for people to go on. I mean, we have such tremendous technology today to watch Dino Dinelli with the Rascals, yeah. to watch Hal Blaine, and to watch and to please view the Wrecking Crew and just observe this and just have this in their collection. It's so important to uh, develop a library like this, a personal library, not only for teachers and instructors and performers, but for general people, people who are just interested and in, just really uh, are, are really enthralled with the whole art form of drumming. I think this is real important. To you know, it's so great you say that because, and recently what came out is a book that was written by Lib DeVito, mm -hmm. that came out, his book, Liberty. It's a very important book to get. And Joe Bergamini, who runs the SEM program, was the editor of that book. So, you know, Joe's been involved with everything from Lib DeVita to Neil Pierce in, in, in editing books of what he's done. And again, Hudson Music, go to HudsonMusic.com. You can get the book stuffed up there. But it's great to have that book on Lib DeVita because it talks about a lot of historical stuff. And he was also very influenced by Dino Danelli. So there are some names that are really kind of popping out that are just really great, great to come out and for people to research and understand. Larry, it is great to have you here. Absolutely. I want to give you one, 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 closing, one closing comment here. A closing comment. Uh, I would just share, we talk about books. I mean, we have Lenny DiMuzio, another yeah. gentleman we can't forget, okay? And of course, Joe's books on Neil Peart, okay? Yeah. And two books which I would recommend to people are Women Drummers, can't yeah. forget, okay? And of course, Drumming Men. Okay. In closing, I just would like to thank you and I want to thank Joe and, of course, everybody from Sabian for their continual support. I really appreciate it through the years. It's just been unbelievable. Thank all the viewers for watching us today. And in closing, we talk about playing drums, not working drums, enjoying your craft, enjoying your involvement with drumming. And remember that it's not about level. It's not about capability. It's about enjoying the instrument more than anything. And as I leave you, I just want to state that watch SEN and play slowly, evenly, and fluidly. Seth, SEF and watch SEN. <laughs> thank you, Tom, and thank you to Joe, and thank you everyone at Sabian. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Larry, so much. So we go back a long ways, and we've been doing this for a long, long time. And what's refreshing to see is, is that you know, you are still on the cutting edge of what's happening. You're still a phenomenal student of the art form, which is a part of why I think you have been around for such a long time because you're oh, you. willing to change and grow and learn and research and find out about new things that are going on. And this is what keeps us open-minded. And this is what keeps us young. And even this next generation, like Catherine Wall from Christchurch, New Zealand, she's up checking it out. And uh, she puts that incredible here as she says, thank you, Larry, and thank you, Dom. This is thank great to see that. that feel it. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I feel that uh, hopefully I can open some doors and give some insight. And the fact is having such great close friends and drummers in my area, Joe Bonville, and of course, Rocky Petroselli and Bob Gerard and Bobby Angeletta, people like that who have been just so, and Jason, who have just been so supportive of me throughout the years. It's just been incredible, an incredible journey. And we're hoping that you and I will be talking about our 50 year friendship. And uh, we Absolutely. Hope, we hope to celebrate 
100 years with Joe Collado next year. Yeah, how fantastic. Larry, thank you so much. It has been not only have you opened up doors, you've opened up minds. Thank Keep you. on going strong. Stay well, stay safe, and I'll talk to you soon for sure. Everyone, too, stay safe, take care, and thank you again for tuning in. I appreciate the time. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye now.